In the murky waters, under the pier, in the quiet retirement seaside resort of Bournemouth on England's south coast, a canoeist made a gruesome discovery. The £10 million Old Bailey trial, which eventually followed, uncovered a crime that shocked even the most hardened detectives. Police traveled to India, France, Belgium, and the United States and collected 4,000 documents in efforts to crack the case. From a watery grave, the detectives were left a vital clue to the fate of an entire family. Metropolitan Police Detective Brian Hook has handled some of the most terrible crimes in the UK's capital city over the last 30 years. He's worked on serial murders, terrorist outrages, random killings and organized crime. He was an investigator with the anti-terrorist branch at Scotland Yard and later a surveillance specialist with the racial and violent crimes team. I knew the detectives that worked on this case. It tested their abilities to the utmost. Worldwide inquiries. This was a massive, massive case. Brian Hook has particular knowledge and expertise in relation to crime scenes. For five years, he was a member of the Metropolitan Police Specialist Crime Directorate Homicide Command. Now he brings this huge wealth of first-hand insight to the story of how his friends and fellow officers investigated the shocking deaths of five members of the same family, including an eight-week-old baby boy. The story begins with the business career of Amarjit Chohan. 46-year-old Amarjit, who was also known as Anil, was born in India and came to England in his early 20s to make his fortune. And it worked. By 2003, he was the owner of a successful haulage company, Seba Freight, based close to the international airport at Heathrow. Dave Little, who was a senior detective on the case, came to know Anil Chohan's story very well. And he understood the community Chohan lived in. West London is a very, very big Asian community, Southall especially, where I had worked previously. Um, so Anil was very much part of that community, and my understanding is very, very well, well respected. Um, he had done very well for himself. He was very popular with um, people who he worked with and worked for him. So I would say he was a big part of that community, certainly in the West London area at that time, yeah. So by 2003, Chohan was a rich man, probably a millionaire. People he knew and worked with thought he was relaxed and friendly. His business style was informal, but obviously successful. He was always on the lookout for new money-making opportunities. On the 13th of February 2003, he leaves his office, apparently to travel to Wiltshire, to meet a man who says he's interested in buying his company for three million pounds in cash. Unfortunately, he didn't tell anyone exactly where he was going or the name of the person he was planning to meet. But Chohan didn't come back from the meeting that day or the next day or the day after that. Amarjit Chohan seemed simply to have vanished. Colleagues at Seba Freight decided to tell the police he was missing. But experienced detectives know that a missing persons report can mean many different things. Every missing person investigation is different, and it's the circumstances that lead to it that make them different. Sometimes it's so out of character, it immediately stands out that that was wrong. Sometimes the story can be plausible, that you do think this is still a missing person. Nonetheless, you've got to start every investigation as a murder investigation, because you lose 
intelligence, you lose evidence very early on if you don't deal with it from that aspect. In fact, there was a reason why Chohan might have wanted to make himself scarce. Maybe even two reasons. Back in 1996, he'd been convicted on 13 charges of tax evasion and had been sentenced to three years in prison. He had a reputation for cutting business corners and for financial tricks he said he'd learnt in jail. He knew some pretty shady people, some of whom he'd also met while serving his sentence. He was always looking over his shoulder and feared further investigation by the authorities. On top of which, he'd married Nancy, the second Mrs. Johan, without actually divorcing the first. He was a bigamist, and it was only a matter of time before that came out into the open. This was a man with things to fear and things to hide. This was a man with a lot of cash and a business which made more cash every day. So he was both vulnerable and in trouble. During the investigation, we discovered that Anil had been married before and had children from a previous marriage. Um, so we liaised with that side of the family as well. I would say a difficulty, we had to cater for one family who were his previous marriage. We had to cater with Onka Verma with the current family. Um, and there was friction between the two of them as well. But certainly um, it, came, it was a big surprise to us, obviously, that there had been a previous family as well. Amarjit Chohan went missing after setting off for an apparently routine business meeting. He didn't tell anyone the meeting was set for a country lane near Stonehenge, one of Britain's most famous national monuments. Perhaps if he had, eyebrows would have been raised. But he didn't, so there was no immediate reason for anyone to be seriously worried. But Chohan himself was in really deep trouble and there was no way he could tell anyone what was happening. When successful businessman Amarjit Chohan went missing, no one paid much immediate attention. His family didn't raise the alarm. Colleagues and employees at his company were used to him being off their radar for a few days while he did a deal or met up with contacts. And neither his family nor his colleagues knew he was worried about the tax authorities again and his private life was extremely tangled. But in reality, his disappearance had a completely different and much more sinister explanation. He'd been forcibly abducted by three men. He was being held prisoner in this ordinary looking house, nearly a hundred miles from London, deep in the English countryside. Inside, Chohan is under intense pressure. He's being coerced to make phone calls to his wife, telling her that he's fine and not to worry. What he doesn't know is that two of the men who are holding him prisoner are on their way back to Chohan's home in West London. The family home has since been knocked down. But here on this site, Nancy, the second Mrs. Chohan, was waiting for her husband to get back. With her were her two young boys, aged just two months and 18 months, and her mother on a visit from India. They were surprised by a knock on the door. Two men pushed their way in and forced the two women and the two little children out of the house and into a hired van. The van drives off at speed. No one knows this yet, but three adults, a toddler and a baby are missing. There are no family members left to tell anyone about it and to raise the alarm. Johan's work colleagues reported him missing, but they didn't know his family had also vanished. So the early story from the police point of view was he was a missing person inquiry. There were circumstances around that inquiry that led it to be a bit more suspicious, so it was a high risk of misbirth. Annual went missing um, in February. There was a story being put about at that time that he'd sold the company and had gone away because of drugs dealing that he was involved in which subsequently will be disproved. Um, so really, it was a high-risk missing person investigation to start off with. Not all missing persons reports are treated the same by police. Lots of people go missing every day and every week. Police have to prioritise the investigation. They look at who's gone missing, the age, the vulnerability. What you have here is a grown man with his family, 
There's nothing in his background or circumstance to suggest nothing other than the fact he's upped and gone back to his own country. But back at the bungalow in Wiltshire, where Chohan is being held prisoner, there's something else going on. Chohan is being forced to sign several blank sheets of headed paper from his own freight company. The kidnappers clearly have business on their mind. Looking at this quiet, dead-end street for himself, Brian Hook can see that whatever was happening in this bungalow must have been in plain sight of the neighbors. The bungalow was occupied by a Mr. Kenneth Reagan and his father. No one in the street knew that a businessman was missing from home, but they must have thought something odd was going on. I've spoken to local residents, some of whom were witnesses uh, during the investigation. One in particular came down early one morning. He saw a white van backed up against the side of the house behind me. He knew Mr. Regan, who was there when he arrived. Mr. Regan appeared shocked to see him that early in the morning. He said his hellos and made his way very quickly back inside. The lights of the bungalow were on. Who knows what was going on inside on that morning. For several weeks, nothing happened. Mr. Chohan was missing from work, but this did not cause major alarm. No one knew his family was also missing. Whatever Mr. Chohan's abductors had planned seemed to be going smoothly, and it might have stayed that way for even longer. But Mrs. Chohan had a brother who lived halfway around the world in New Zealand. For three weeks, he tried to reach his sister on the phone without success. Finally, he gave up and got on a plane to see what was going on. Finding the house empty and no sign of any single member of the family, he raises the alarm and calls the police. The brother arriving from New Zealand changes the whole focus of the investigation. A senior investigating officer is appointed from the Specialist Crime Directorate. They're going to look at all the facts that are known up to this point. They have the resources, they have the detective ability to look into every nook and cranny of what's happened so far, dissect it and take that investigation forward to find out exactly what's happened to the family. This all takes time. It seems incredible, but Chohan and his whole family have now been missing for nearly two months. I've seen the case files of this investigation and having looked at them in some detail, it does appear on the face of it that what the family have done have just uplifted from England and just gone back to India. In fact, that's exactly what the staff at his company were thinking. Four days after Mr. Chohan first disappeared, the company was bought by someone called Kenneth Reagan. He installed a woman called Belinda Bruett as the accounts manager, and Sieber was being run as normal under new ownership. People who worked there weren't all that surprised or suspicious. Just thought it was another example of Chohan's not very orthodox business methods. At this stage of the investigation, people weren't really particularly worried. Mr. Chohan had had a, a bit of a shady past. And I think most people just thought that he'd upped and decided things were a little bit too hot and left. But the missing Mrs. Chohan's brother doesn't give up. Pressed by him, the Metropolitan Police passed the case to the Serious Crime Directorate in Scotland Yard. They decide to go back to Seba Freight. And on the 21st of March, 2003, for the first time, they take a statement from the new owner, Kenneth Reagan. Reagan shows all his ownership documents to Scotland Yard's detectives. It all looks above board. Former Detective Chief Inspector Dave Little was later past the case. When he reviewed the available information, alarm bells started to ring. I think any investigation, you get a feeling for the investigation very early on. Um, sometimes you can't put your finger on exactly what it is or why you don't feel something's quite right. From the outset, this was a missing person investigation. This is somebody who had disappeared for a little bit of a period of time. But from the outset, if you looked at all the component parts of it, there was something not quite right about it. For the next month, Scotland Yard quietly reviews the case. 
They track down Johan's family home in India. Dave Little sends a team to the Punjab. The investigation did become a global investigation from New Zealand through to Canada, via Spain, Belgium, France, obviously the UK. Um, it, it was very global and, and India was a very important part of the investigation as well. It was a, a very, it's a, yeah, it was a massive investigation in the first instance. Um, and I think to this day, it's still the longest murder trial at the Old Bailey. So it was a very, very um, intensive, long investigation, yeah. Hindsight's a wonderful thing, but all the evidence points to Johan selling up and just moving. Seba Freight's new owner really should have been looked at a little bit more carefully. The alarm bell should have been ringing. He was already known to the police by the name of Ken Avery. Ken Avery was a known career criminal with a lengthy record for drug smuggling and other serious offences. He had a taste for the high life, funded with stolen money. After giving evidence against fellow criminals, he was released early from jail under a new name, Kenneth Reagan. A new name, but with the old passion for cash and power. Maybe the new owner of Chohan's company was involved in his disappearance. Kenneth Reagan is now very much on the police radar, and worse is to come. The missing persons case is about to become a multiple murder inquiry. In the early months of 2003, a mystery is unfolding that turns into the longest murder trial in the history of the Metropolitan Police. The police investigation took detectives to India, the United States, and three European countries. At first, it was a case of missing persons. In April 2003, it became something altogether different. All investigations are about hard work and endeavour. But also, you need a little bit of luck. And two months into this investigation, that little bit of luck came their way. In the early hours of the 22nd of April, two days after Easter Sunday, a lone boating enthusiast is peacefully paddling around Bournemouth Pier on the south coast of England when he bumps into something floating in the water. He calls the local police. The object in the water is a dead body, which has been there for some time. Police called in a local pathologist. Well, in this case, I was uh, phoned by the police, informed that a body had been found floating uh, off uh, the Bournemouth Pier. The diagnosis of drowning in a decomposed body is very difficult and may be impossible. But obviously, drowning is a possibility. What you're trying to determine is whether the person has entered the water alive. They may have entered it dead for reasons of natural disease or intoxication or injury. There's all sorts of possibilities. So uh, all of those things remain to be investigated. When the body is taken to the mortuary, the hunt for his identity starts. Although the body is severely decomposed, the police manage to take his fingerprints. Anil Chohan's past is catching up with him. Having had a criminal record for fraud, his fingerprints are on file. The body floating in the water was that of the missing businessman. At this point, the Chohan case lands on Detective Chief Inspector Dave Little's desk. So it started off as high-risk missing person, person escalated to a murder investigation, and then obviously subsequently his body was found when it was confirmed as a murder. And there were clear signs that Chohan had been murdered. He had a very severe head wound, and there were the remains of a gag on his face. But put it this way, we've got someone with what looks like a gag, and possibly a blindfold, who has a very severe head injury. This was no accidental drowning. It was a series of turns of brown adhesive parcel tape 
mingled with a red and white scarf that went round and round the head, below the nose, right across the mouth. And attached at the back of it was the rest of the roll of tape. So that was all sort of hanging on at the back. And the little bridge of tape between the turns round the face and the roll itself had gone into a thin, strong string of that brown parcel tape. A gag may kill you. Mr. Chohan may actually have been killed by the gag. Any circumstances like that, my first thought is forensic evidence. For somebody to be gagged with tape, as that was, I would always hope that there's going to be some forensic evidence, either fingerprints or DNA, on that tape. So for me, it's actually a very important part of the investigation. The only lead that Chief Inspector Little has is Seba Freight, Chohan's old company, and its new owner, Kenneth Reagan. Reagan appeared to me to be very arrogant, and he had, and had all out throughout his life, manipulated people. He actually had a persona far greater than his real worth. When he came out of prison after the drugs case, he obviously had access to far less money than he had done previously. He was called Captain Cash. So everybody that he'd met with, he lived the high life. Um, he always had money, always had cash around him. 55-year-old Reagan may not have had the looks of a wealthy playboy and international criminal mastermind, but that's how he saw himself. Back in 1997, as the money rolled in from his drug smuggling enterprises, he was called Ken Avery and drove around in a Mercedes, reveling in the nickname of Captain Cash. But he sailed too close to the wind, and in 1998 he was jailed for his involvement in a heroin smuggling ring and a passport racket. Avery had no intention of spending valuable time in prison. He turned on his co-defendants gave evidence against them and was rewarded with a shorter sentence, just four years. When you talk to these people, the career criminals that have spent their life involved in high-level criminality, they're very plausible, they're very believable, and they have a facade um, that will make most people think that they've got their money legitimately. But that's not the case. People like Reagan won't like to live below that status and that perceived lifestyle when they come down they come down with one almighty crash they don't like it in 2003 avery was out of jail he changed his name to reagan and was the new owner of seba freight he asked a woman friend called belinda bruin to join the company as managing director and credit controller he offers her a salary of £72,000 for a position for which she has no qualifications whatsoever. Ken and Belinda's relationship goes back to 1997, when they meet in the ritzy top floor bar of Harvey Nichols, one of London's smartest department stores. Reagan showers her with offers of glamorous trips and expensive gifts. Their relationship fizzles out while Reagan is in jail, but he sends a condolence note to her when he reads about the death of a celebrity friend and he looks her up when he's released. Her own life has taken a turn for the worse. Although she has the outward trappings of wealth, her partner has by now left her. She's left with mortgage repayments and school fees and risks losing her 50-acre estate in Devon. Reagan is recently out of jail and needs someone to run the company he's acquired. Someone he can use as a respectable front. So, just when she's strapped for cash, he persuades her to join his newly acquired company, Seba Freight. No previous convictions would make you a likely suspect to be a murderer. However, all of the facts put together and the circumstances leading to Kenneth Reagan taking over part of the company, being there at the time, having the opportunity, having the motive, then he certainly comes into the scale of somebody, scheme of somebody who could be involved in it. I think when you've got as much experience as me and you've met so many people, lots of investigations, you kind of get a feeling about people. Something's not quite right. 
And that's a feeling you just can't ignore at your peril. If you ignore that, things can go wrong. At this stage, Chief Inspector Little had no way of connecting Kenneth Reagan to the killing. But it was Reagan himself who handed the police the clues they needed because he panicked. On the day Mr. Chohan left his office for the last time, he was actually going to meet Reagan on the pretext of a business proposition. When he got to the meeting point near Stonehenge, Reagan, with two accomplices, William Hornsey and Peter Rees, forced Chohan into their van and drove him to Reagan's father's house, where they held him captive. Two days later, Reagan and Hornsey traveled back to London and persuaded Mrs. Chohan, her two tiny children, and her mother to leave with them. They were bundled into the van and taken to Wiltshire to be united with Mr. Chohan. Sometime over the next four days, the entire family was murdered. And their bodies were taken to Tiverton in Devon, where they were buried in a field. So far, Reagan's crime was completely undetected. There was nothing to connect him directly to the family's disappearance. If he'd done nothing further, Reagan might have got away with his crime. But then, he made a huge mistake. No matter how clever criminals think they are, they all make mistakes. Those mistakes are things that we can capitalize on. And moving the bodies in this occasion was certainly one of the biggest mistakes Reagan was ever going to make. If Reagan had left the Chohan family's bodies buried where they were, things might have been different. But he senses the police are closing in on him. And from his point of view, he made the wrong choice. Over the Easter weekend of 2003, when a body is found floating in the sea by Bournemouth Pier, a missing persons case became murder. Kenneth Reagan made a very calculated decision to move the evidence away from where it was because he thought the police were getting closer to that evidence. So, f from his perspective, had he left the bodies in situ in Tiverton, then they would have been found much earlier. So it was a calculated decision. It was, there was a risk involved, obviously, because having interned them once, he then dug them up again. Um, but to actually move them and take them somewhere else was his only option at that time. And Reagan came up with an elaborate plan to try to make the police believe he knew Chohan was alive and well. He told police he had a meeting arranged with the missing man near a bronze statue of a pig in South Wales. And all they had to do was come along and watch. So his ploy was to say Anil Chohan was going to meet up in Wales at the pig and he would take the police to him. And then he went through a very um, intricate and bizarre um, amount of form of actions, pretending to get text messages, saying that he'd got text messages from Anil. So he carried on the story, even whilst he was there with police officers watching purely to carry on the pretense. Undercover detectives monitor the rendezvous point in the centre of Newport, South Wales. But of course, Chohan fails to turn up. Reagan thought he'd laid a false trail to throw the police off him. I think Ken Reagan thought he's a match for anybody. Um, he, I've already said, his persona was somebody who was very controlling, um, very, very confident. He portrayed himself to be far bigger than he was. And, yeah, I certainly think that he thought he could beat the police at this one, yes. On Easter Saturday, Reagan and his accomplices go back to Devon and dig up the five bodies, two months after they were murdered. Reagan buys a boat, and the next day, the three of them sail out to sea. The whole Chohan family is brutally disposed of, tipped into the cold waters of the English Channel. Reagan thought this would put him in the clear. The bodies would never be found, the police would have no leads. He thought from his previous encounters with police that he had special insight into their way of thinking. Before he gave evidence against his co-conspirators, he spent a lot of time with the police because he turned Queen's evidence and gave evidence against his drug smuggling gang. He thinks he knows the way that the police mind works. 
Don't forget, that's a two-way street. That also means they know the way his mind works as well. Meanwhile, Dave Little decided to meet Belinda Bruin. He needed to understand her role in this story. But she can tell him nothing at all. Belinda Bruin was not charged with any offence in connection with the case. As soon as Reagan had dumped the Chohan family bodies in the sea, he decides to flee. He catches a ferry to France with Hornsey. Reese goes on the run and hides out with a friend in Gloucestershire. Then, Mr. Chohan's body is found in the sea, clearly a murder victim. Reagan had taken part of the company ostensibly. He had given the story for Anil Chohan being alive and disappearing for various reasons. Um, Chohan's body turned up, obviously, so now we know that he's dead. But once Reagan had moved the body from Tiverton to um, the Solent, then obviously, for him to leave the country, you've got to start wondering why is Kenneth Reagan, the person who's been assisting the police right up until this time, the person who ostensibly owns part of the company, why has he left the country? Now the police have suspects on the run and a mystery to unearth. Where is the rest of Mr. Chohan's family? And as yet, not a shred of evidence with which to build a case. Very shortly after Anil's body was found in Bournemouth, it, we realised that um, Kenneth Reagan had left the country via Dover. Once again, that in itself doesn't prove that somebody committed a murder. But when you've got all the circumstances that I've already mentioned leading up to Kenneth Reagan, you can focus your investigation a lot better. The first thing the police did was to search Chohan's home in London for evidence. The most important thing when the police arrived there is there's no sign of any disturbance. There's no sign of any fight. So when they go into the house, they're looking for things that are out of the normal, that are unusual. And really, it's a reverse unusual. They're looking at normality. The people that left there have left expecting to come back. They've left behind suitcases. They've left behind tickets that are return journey to India. The family holy book is still there. Nappies for the children. People that left there that day, I think, fully expected to come back later on. And then Dave Little gets some very interesting news from the pathologist, who'd been examining the body of Mr. Chohan. And perhaps the most distinctive items of all the things we left deliberately till last were a series of bindings around the lower head and face. Um, I described them as a gag, and I put gag in quotes because it's not necessarily fair to describe something as a gag after a body's been in water for a considerable length of time, things slip and move about, but it looked very much like it. And there was one more surprise to come. The condition of Chohan's body suggested to the pathologist that he might have been buried on land before being dumped in the sea. Somehow, his body had been protected from infestation by flies. When it comes to uh, the progress of the case as it goes along, I'm guided by the police. So if the police come back to me and say, listen, doctor, could the body have been buried on land for a while before it went in the sea? That's the sort of question I'm asked, and I will then comment. The case of Mr. Chohan, I would say yes. That would account for flies not getting at his body, uh, and that could well have happened. This completely alters the police investigation, and there was a further sign that Chohan's body might have been dug up from a grave. When I was asked um, if the body had been removed by a mechanical digger, that would have any impact on my uh, opinion as, as to what had happened to him. I'd say, well, I don't know exactly what a digger bucket looks like, but it's the sort of thing that might account in a single blow for the very bad damage to his head and neck. Experienced detectives know where to start looking when they're searching for the grave of a victim of crime. Brian Hook knows from many years of policing that there are patterns to criminal behavior. Now that Mr. Chine's body's been found, this investigation goes to a whole new level. 
But there's a discrepancy. Mr. Chan has been missing for longer than he's been in the water. The police are now going to look at their main suspect, Mr. Regan. If Mr. Chowan's body's been held somewhere, it'll be somewhere that Regan is comfortable with, with people that he trusts. Melinda Bruin is interviewed again, and she lets slip that she knows about the hoax meeting at the Bronze Pig in South Wales. And that's the piece of the jigsaw puzzle Dave Little needs. I've been talking about Chohan. And Dave Little suspects that Reagan would have thought that Belinda Bruin's spacious grounds in Devon were a safe place to bury a body. Little sends a team down to her country estate. He had good reason to think Reagan might have been there. Mobile phone records were very important in this investigation. Um, a, because it showed us who was contacting who. Um, and in the evidence, we actually brought that out at trial that Reagan and Hornsey and Reese were certainly in contact with each other. But also where they were when they were doing that. And then we can trace where, um, when Nancy and the rest of the family went missing from Hounslow, we could say that Reagan was in Hounslow at that time. And we can say they went down to the West Country. So the mobile phone evidence did help an awful lot with that. And the evidence that came out of court helped prove their involvement. The police dig a trench in the grounds of Belinda Bruin's estate and find what they're looking for, a burial site. Far too big for one body. This could have been the burial site for an entire family. It was more and more clear that police were dealing with a multiple killing. Belinda Bruin said she had no idea that the bodies were buried on her land. It's the whole family that's being murdered, yeah. That is the, the global thing of it, yeah. Um, the fact that this murder took place, and there were three generations of the family wiped out. There was obviously the grandmother, the two adults, and the two children, um, one of whom was just a toddler, not even a toddler. So there were three whole generations wiped out, and to this day we still don't know where the two children are. Um, their bodies have never been recovered. Now the detectives have to track down Kenneth Reagan and put together the evidence they need to take him to court and pay for his callous crime. Three months after businessman Amarjit Chohan first went missing, the Metropolitan Police now know they're dealing with a murder case. Mr. Chohan was definitely a murder victim and his body had been found. His wife, mother-in-law and two children were still missing. But the size of the grave found in Devon offered a grim clue to their fate. And Detective Chief Inspector Dave Little is closing in on his prime suspect, Kenneth Reagan. The investigation isn't over when you've identified the suspect. That's when the hard work begins. That's when you have to look at the evidence you've gathered to make sure that the continuity, the integrity of, of all the evidence that you've got is going to be able to stand up in court when those people are charged. Dave Little's team examined all the phone evidence they could get hold of, which connected Kenneth Reagan and his accomplices. The investigation, as it focused more and more on Kenneth Reagan, we looked at his associates, who he'd been with, the people he'd been in contact with at various times, and as a result of which, Hornsey and Reese came more and more into the investigation. And then once again, we've proved the association between them and the fact that they were there at certain times. Um, which was the evidence that convicted them in the end. And in the UK, police are able to use cameras fitted with software which identifies car owners from their registered sites. The phone cam enabled DCI Little's team to trace Ken Reagan's movements. So we did identify that somebody called Reagan had hired vehicles. At one stage, you get a snippet of information which then leads you to look at something else. And then you get the CCTV, which will give you a registration number. You can look at the registration number, who hired it, where it came from. So all the information f follows on from each other. And as you get one little bit, it actually opens a, a whole new sphere of the investigation, basically. The white van has been pressure hosed inside, but that's far from bad news for the scene of crime officers. A criminal can use a pressure hose and think he's washed away all traces of his crime 
But in reality, the hosing makes the job easier for the police. When the van went into the laboratory, the scientists would have deconstructed the insides. High pressure hose, magnificent. All that's done, as well as taking away what appears to be on the surface, has pushed into the crevices and the cracks some of that evidence. Scientists will deconstruct that van and swab what's underneath the boards, what's underneath the metal. The result of the examination of the van by the scientists found bodily fluids from the Chalhan family. We don't know whether they were alive or dead in the back of that van, but at some point they were most certainly in that van. But it's not all plain sailing for DCI Little and his team. Reagan's home address is his father's bungalow in Wiltshire. Everything points to this being where Chohan was held, and probably where the rest of his family were brought to. There's a strong possibility this is where all of them were killed. The scene of crime team is sent in. When the crime scene investigators arrived at Reagan's father's house, they're looking for trace evidence, the smallest amount of evidence that you can possibly find at a crime scene. There was absolutely nothing there. It had been cleaned. It was clean as a whistle. Things had been replaced. There was no evidence there whatsoever inside that house. On the outside wall, they found a tiny, tiny blood spot. Examination of that later with the laboratory revealed it belonged to one of the Chohan's children. There may not have been much forensic evidence, but there was enough to convince police this was the right place. So it was probably here that Mr. Chohan was held for three days, drugged and gagged, forced to make telephone calls to his family and sign away his freight company to Ken Reagan. But Chohan shows extraordinary bravery during his ordeal. While left alone in the bungalow, he finds some letters with Reagan's address on them. He picks one up, writes a message on it about what was happening, folds it into quarters, then eighths, and slips it inside his sock. He puts his shoe back on and waits for his fate. Pathologist Basil Perdue went through Chohan's clothes at the time of the initial autopsy. The color of his clothing had been somewhat altered by being in seawater for quite some time. And I described his main garment on the top as a navy blue or purple sweatshirt. You can imagine there was some fading and changing of colour. So it had long sleeves and a V-neck. And uh, it, it had a maker's name and things of that sort. There were socks on his feet, which later assumed a much greater importance. After the autopsy... A forensic scientist was routinely analyzing Chohan's personal effects and clothing. He found the astonishing and vital clue still stuck inside Chohan's sock. Obviously, Anil knew something bad was going to happen to him. Um, he'd obviously been kept captive. Um, Reese had been guarding over him while the other two went to get the rest of the family. So. At some stage during that time, he had the foresight to write a letter or a note on a piece of paper and hide it inside of his sock, which wasn't found until his body was found. And then because it was wet, it was left to dry. And subsequently it was examined and it did actually say everything that happened in the letter. So it was a damning piece of evidence, immense courage and foresight. Um, at that stage, you've got to assumed that he knew he was going to die. So he wrote that, and it was reported at the time as a letter from the grave, which it actually was. Dave Little's evidence against Reagan and his accomplices is mounting. Now all he has to do is find him and bring him to justice. On the day that Reagan and his accomplices dump the Chohan family in the sea, they go on the run. Reagan just gets in his car and keeps driving, takes the cross-channel ferry to Calais, and heads for Spain. Once Reagan had been declared as the main suspect in the investigation, and he crossed the channel into Europe, it didn't matter where he went. We have ways of finding people and tracing them, which I won't go into here. There was no way he was not ever, ever going to get caught. It's just a matter of time. Reagan was arrested in Belgium, um, and we started extradition proceedings in Belgium. He fought them originally. 
Um, so there was a bit of a time delay to get back into the country. But eventually the Belgian authorities upheld the extradition and he was brought back to this country and that's when he was charged of the murders in this country. Yes, it's always a good day when you finally charge somebody for new investigations, yes. On the 8th of November 2004, Kenneth Reagan and his two accomplices, William Hornsey and Dave Rees, are brought to the Old Bailey. After an eight-month murder trial, Reagan and Hornsey are convicted of Mr. Chohan and his family's murder and receive whole life sentences. Reese got 15 years, convicted of just Chohan's murder. The actual cause of death has never been fully established, but police believe all the family members were probably strangled. The fact that the bodies of the children were never found did not alter the court's view that they were murder victims. Sentencing the convicted men, the judge said, the misery, pain and suffering which you have visited on the surviving members of Mr. and Mrs. Chohan's family are immeasurable, not least because of the contemptible treatment of the bodies of their relatives, and not least because the bodies of those two tiny children have never been recovered. When the guilty verdicts came in, there's an immense feeling of relief. I think they got everything they deserved because Reagan and Hornsby both got whole life sentences. The only motive that I can see was purely financial. That family died because Reagan wanted more money. Um, and that's a travesty. Any death is bad. But this was just pure greed, the motivation behind this one. And especially when two of the victims were very, very young children. You know, who, they wouldn't even have known what's happening or anything. So, um, you know, it, it was quite a tragic way for them to come to their ends. There's one last terrible detail. The bodies of the two Chohan children have never been found. Their grandmother's body washed up on the Isle of Wight in September 2003. Their mother was hauled up in a fishing net that July. After Anil had been found off Bournemouth, uh, sometime later Nancy's body was actually picked up by a trawler, a fisherman trawling. And as the body was, well, as the bundle came up out of the water in the fisherman's nets, the fisherman did see something fall from the net back into the sea, which we can only suppose were the bodies or the body of one of the children. So. I don't know because we never know what it was that fell back in there. But under the circumstances, I think the main supposition has got to be that those were the children's bodies, which have never been found since. This was a killing motivated by greed alone. A man who wanted cash quickly. A man ruthless enough to kill an entire family in order to steal their business. A man willing to cross the line to get what he wanted.